Good afternoon. My name is April Craig, and I'm the Senior Product Manager for Therapeutic Testing at Mayo Clinic Laboratories and your moderator for today's session. I would like to welcome you to the third presentation in our Advancing Care Through Genomics Virtual Speaker Series. This series focuses on presenting new information and ideas in laboratory medicine and pathology in individualized medicine. Before we get started, please be advised that we have time planned for Q&A at the end of this presentation. To submit questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our featured speaker today is Dr. Ann Moyer. Dr. Moyer is a molecular genetic pathologist at Mayo Clinic and holds the academic rank of Associate Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, as well as Assistant Professor of Pharmacology. Dr. Moyer earned her medical and graduate degrees as part of Mayo Clinic's Medical Scientist Training Program under the mentorship of Dr. Richard Weinstelbaum. Her thesis work focused on pharmacogenomics of phase two drug metaboli metabolizing enzymes, and she completed her residency training in anatomic and clinical pathology with an additional year devoted to research, followed by a fellowship in molecular genetic pathology, also at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Moyer's current clinical and research interests include pharmacogenomics, primary immunodeficiencies, and renal genetics. Today, Dr. Moyer will be discussing recent advances in pharmacogenomics. Individual differences in medication response can be explained in part by genetic variation. Inclusion of genetic information and drug label labels coupled with the availability of professional guidelines that facilitate the use of genetic information in therapy selection and dosing, along with decreasing costs of pharmacogenomic testing, has led to an increase in adoption of pharmacogenomics into routine clinical care. This presentation will describe the current use of pharmacogenomics, as well as provide insights into future developments. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ann Moyer. Thank you for the introduction, April, and for the opportunity to present at today's webinar. I am just gonna get my slides up. All right. Well, welcome everybody to today's webinar. And as April already discussed, we'll be talking today about recent advances in pharmacogenomics. I have no disclosures. And I think you saw the learning objectives flashing across your screen while you were waiting to join, but we're going to start out by talking about some of the basic concepts in pharmacogenomics. And then we will talk about the transition from reactive to preemptive testing, which is occurring as we speak today. Also some recent standardization efforts. And I'll finish by comparing sequencing-based approaches to targeted genotyping, along with the associated challenges that we face by trying to make that transition. And then just a few nuggets of where we might be headed in the future. So we'll start out with some basic concepts in pharmacogenomics to make sure everybody is at least on the same page of what we're talking about. And there's some actual new advancements even in this area. So when a patient takes a drug, we would hope that over time, which is on our x-axis, the drug concentration would stay within what we call a therapeutic window. So every time they take a dose of the drug, we expect the concentration to go up. And over time, they'll metabolize some of it away until the next dose when the concentration increases. And it's important for the patients to stay within that therapeutic window because if their levels get too high, they might develop toxicity. Too low, they might develop lack of efficacy. And it's important to note that different drugs might have a really big therapeutic window or a small one for some drugs. So some patients though, when they take the same dose of the same medication, instead of metabolizing it like we saw on our green line, they might not metabolize it quite as well. So over time, you can imagine that their levels might build up and perhaps they'll experience toxicity. And on the flip side, some patients might actually metabolize medications faster than the average patient. And therefore over time, they may end up with too low of concentration and have a lack of efficacy. Now it's a lot more complicated than this, but this is just kind of the basic schema to be thinking about how individual variation might impact drug response phenotypes. So if we knew which group a patient would fall in, we could alter the drug or the dose. And that's really what we're trying to do with pharmacogenomics is we're trying to predict which of those lines that patient will fall on. And so I think it's really important before we even start talking about the genetics to mention that there are a lot of variables that all can impact medication responses. And I've shown a number of them on the screen, 
And indeed, my favorite is genetics. So that's really what we're going to be talking about today. But please don't forget about all of the other variables that are also really important when talking about dosing patients with medications. So why pharmacogenomics is really exciting and something that people are looking at right now and trying to implement is almost all of us have variants in pharmacogenes that will impact drug metabolism or drug response. And so this is just some data from a study that we performed at Mayo Clinic that I'll talk a little bit more about later on. But there were 10,000 patients that had genetic testing done for pharmacogenomics. We looked at 12 pharmacogenes clinically that are shown here, and we sequenced them. And what we found is that it was only 0.6% of these 10,000 people that did not have a genetic variant identified in one of those 12 genes that we thought would impact drug metabolism. So really that's over 99% of people had a variant in one of these genes that we looked at that could be potentially clinically actionable. And so this is important because over our lifetimes, there are very few of us that end up never taking any medication. And you never know which medication a specific patient will end up taking. But in general, our odds are pretty good of pharmacogenomics being potentially relevant for all of us because of so many of us having genetic variants and taking medications over a lifetime. So in general, when we're looking at drug metabolizing enzymes in particular, patients can fall anywhere on a spectrum. So they can be poor metabolizers with virtually no en enzyme activity, all the way up to for some genes and some enzymes, we see examples where patients are ultra rapid metabolizers, where they have faster metabolism than the average person. And then there are the patients where the dosing is designed for that are the normal or what we used to call extensive metabolizers that would metabolize a medication about the same as the average person in the population. But again, it's hard to say what the average person is in the population when you know there's so much variability here. But again, where the individual is going to fall on this spectrum is what we can predict by genetic testing. So here's something new that I wanted to toss in there. So we usually just talk about these terms, poor metabolizer or normal metabolizer and whatnot. But for some of the genes, we're now starting to incorporate in something new. So it's not really new, but maybe new to the report if you're ordering pharmacogenomic testing. But this is the activity score. And really what the activity score is, is another way to describe how active that patient's enzyme would be expected to be. So in general, people with an enzyme activity score of zero would again have no enzyme activity and these people would be classified as poor metabolizers. And because we're looking at two different alleles, one from each parent that's inherited, the scale goes from zero to one. So a normal allele that would be expected to have full 100% activity would be given an activity score of one. So then when you add the two alleles together, that's how you end up at two. And then again, this is a whole spectrum. So a little bit more on the activity scores. Again, it's just another way to represent enzyme activity. And in this case, since we're assigning the score based on relative activity, again, when you add together the two alleles, what we consider a normal metabolizer is 2.0. And this is something we've actually been using for CYP2D6 for some time. And recently, though, there was a standardization effort because historically, some laboratories said that patients who had an activity score for CYP2D6 of 1.0 would be considered normal metabolizers and other laboratories considered that inter intermediate metabolizer. So although I've laid out some rough scores across the bottom, it can vary by gene, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So at this point, because of the standardization though, now laboratories would be uh, classifying patients with an activity score of one, so usually a normal allele and a non-functional allele for CYP2D6 as an intermediate metabolizer. But good to know if you're looking at an older report, that may not be the case. So in addition, the activity scores have recently been added for some additional genes and drugs in the guidelines, so specifically the CPIC guidelines. So DPYD is the gene that encodes the DPD enzyme, and in this particular case, it metabolizes the fluoropyrimidines, and then CYP2C9, which metabolizes NSAIDs and phenytoin. So as I mentioned, there are some nuances to the assignment of the activity scores. So here you can see the activity scores uh, going from zero to increased at three, and the activity, or sorry, the metabolizer status that would be assigned for CYP2D6 versus CYP2C9 and DPYD. And you can see that for these two, they fall along similar lines, but then for CYP2D6, it's shifted a little bit. So I think activity scores are something particularly interesting right now because historically how the assignment has been performed is based on either in vitro studies or in vivo studies. So once we have an idea of how that specific form of the enzyme 
its activity compared to the wild type, then that's where the activity score was assigned based on. And historically, the assignments then would be rounded to the nearest 0.5. So if you can imagine, sometimes somebody might, or their, the enzyme might have an activity score that's 10% of normal. Well, we didn't usually get that granular, in part because it's a little bit hard to get that granular with experimental studies. So these would end up getting rounded. But what's interesting is also along the same time when CYP2D6 was being, uh, the standardized standardization efforts took place, uh, star 10 allele, which has intermediate or ex has activity between 0 0.5 and, and 0, they ended up reassigning this one to having uh, 0.25 rather than being rounded up to 50%. So this is something that even though there's this paradigm for going 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and so on, sometimes alleles are found that maybe need some further granularity beyond that. And in addition, recently a paper was published just last year that was indicating maybe there are some other alleles that might need to be reconsidered as well. So for CYP2D6 again, star 41 and star nine. So I think this is an emerging area that we might hear about more changes. But the thing that's also kind of interesting is some experts feel like using a continuous scale would be better than using these, uh, these marks of 0 0.5 and 1, even if we did adjust some of them down to 0.25. So maybe that 10%, if we think we can get granular enough with our experimental data, maybe that's a better way to go instead of rounding. And yet other groups are recently applying AI-based approaches to data sets to see if there might be better ways to generate activity scores, or in some cases, maybe don't even assign an activity score, but allow the AI to utilize the data set to figure out the ac predicted activity without even going through activity scores or metabolizer status. So I think the activity score is something that's kind of new and exciting. It's been implemented for a couple of genes, and I'd expect it to show up perhaps for other genes in the future. But again, we'll have to see if we stick with activity scores or if the field moves on to a different approach altogether. So in general, when we're talking about pharmacogenomic genes of interests, the ones that I've been really talking about the most so far are involved in pharmacokinetic pathways. So this can involve absorption, distribution, tissue localization, metabolism, and excretion of drugs. But really, I feel like where we spend a lot of our time in pharmacogenomics is within the metabolism part of pharmacokinetics. So this is where the cytochrome P450s fall in and the phase two drug metabolizing enzymes. And again, pretty much things that are metabolizing drugs, or it's what the body is doing to the drug on the pharmacokinetic side. Now, an area where I think we'll see more knowledge over time is on the pharmacodynamic side. So this is the biochemical and the physiological effects of the drug or how the drug is actually carrying out its mechanism, or another way to think of it, what the drug does to the body. So I'll show in a slide and uh, some examples, but SLC6A4 is a serotonin transporter, for example, and the selective serotonin transporter read uptake inhibitors uh, work on this serotonin transporter that are used for depression. And then there's another category, the major histocompatibility complex genes or the HLAs. And these ones are very interesting because the reactions that patients can experience when they are positive for one of these alleles and receive an associated drug is that they can have very, very significant fatal skin reactions. And so since the reactions can be so incredibly toxic and uh, disruptive for these patients, these are ones that are ones that we tend to be very, very careful about. And in fact, I'll talk about it more later, but we do uh, upfront testing before the patient gets the drug in a lot of cases because of the severity of the toxicity for these. So again, here's just a snapshot of what a pharmacokinetic pathway looks like versus a pharmacodynamic pathway. And I'm using as an example, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which again are used for depression. So specifically, uh, this is an example with citalopram. And on the pharmacokinetic pathway, I've circled in green CYP2C19, which is one of the enzymes that can metabolize citalopram and it is included in the FDA label and in a CPIC guideline. So this is one that gets really quite commonly used today. And on the flip side, on the pharmacodynamic pathway, we've got SLC6A4 that I mentioned a little bit ago being a transporter of serotonin. And then we've got HTR2, which is a receptor for serotonin. And at this point, these are not incorporated into the FDA label or in any guidelines, but there is literature suggesting that there may potentially be utility for looking at genetic variation in the genes encoding these molecules. 
So in general, at this point, there are quite a few very common pharmacogenomic associations, and many of these are in clinical use today, where people will order a test either before the patient goes on the medication, or in some cases to try to explain why they're not responding how you'd expect. So we have quite a few different genes that are incorporated into guidelines and FDA labels. And then you can see here's the associated medications. And it's not a giant list that I'm showing here, but these are just some of the more common indications that you might see testing for. But it's important to note that every day, it seems like there's a new drug that's getting approved by the FDA. And just in recent years, there was a drug saponamod that had been approved in 2019. And right in the FDA label, it talks about CYP2C9. And then there was another drug that the name of it's slipping my mind right now, but I just got a call a couple of weeks about, ago about it, where CYP2B17, I believe, is right included in the FDA label. And that's not even a gene that we normally test for clinically on a routine basis right now. So as new drugs are approved and they've got pharmacogenomic associations, that's going to be a challenge for us in the laboratory to keep up with developing new tests to be able to make sure we're covering all of the genes. So speaking of sources of evidence-based pharmacogenomic information, I already mentioned the FDA labels and here in the US, that's our primary source that we always look at first. So if the FDA label talks about needing to do some testing or how you would use those results, that's the, definitely the first place to look. But in addition, there are published practice guidelines and really the most active group here in the US is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium or for short, CPIC. It's a little bit easier to say than the other full mouthful, but they're a very active group in constantly publishing new guidelines and updating the old guidelines. And I think this has been really helpful for the community to adapt pharmacogenomics. Now, outside of the US, the Dutch Pharmacogenomics Working Group is also extremely active in this area, and they also have quite a few guidelines. And sometimes they come up with a guideline before CPIC might in the US. And sometimes we like to look at these too, because I think they're very well vetted and good source of it, sources of information. And in addition, there are various professional societies throughout the US that might develop a guideline based on a drug that's used in their specific clinical area. Now, another really good source of information is the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base, or we call it PharmGKB for short, and you can see the link to that one here. And they do a really good job of putting together pathway diagrams, like the ones that I just showed a minute ago for the SSRIs. And in addition, they curate the literature. So it's a really good place to go uh, before you start doing your own literature search, because they've usually gathered most of what you wanted to find anyway. So it's a, a really good, quick place to look for what's new. And then of course, we're always looking at the literature as well. So here's just a screenshot to kind of give you an idea about how extensive pharmacogenomic testing menus could be at this point. So on the left here, we've got a variety of different genes that might be tested. So this would be kind of a snapshot of what we're doing in our laboratory, in fact. And then we offer some of these as single gene tests. So maybe you only want CYP1A2, well, you can order just CYP1A2. But we also have a number of panels now. So we've got a focused panel that involves a number of these genes of panel that's specific to psychiatry, and it's a little bit different assortment. And then we've got some that are specific for thiopurines, for warfarin, or for carbamazepine. And so it's kind of difficult sometimes to keep up with the test menu, but they're designed for different applications. And in a few slides, we'll talk a little bit more about why you might think about a single gene versus a panel, and how exciting it is that we now have panels available. So I also just wanted to give a quick snapshot of what a report might look like. So if somebody orders a single gene test, you'll usually get a genotype and a phenotype, and then you'll get an interpretation along with that. But oftentimes for the interpretation for a single gene, since we're not really sure what exactly the indication was that it was ordered for, we might not give a lot of details about a particular medication, but the user of this report could go back and use a CPIC guideline or look at the FDA label, and that's how they would know how to use this type of information. And then for some of our panels, we've gotten a little bit fancier where we list medications and then we can group them by the type of medication and then by whether there might be a pharmacogenomic interaction or whether there's, we looked for pharmacogenomic interactions, but there was really nothing significant for that particular patient, or also some genes that we've been curating the literature and we don't really think that pharmacogenomics at this point in time is terribly helpful. So they'll show up in this part of the report for every patient. So the thing that's important though, is you can't really just look at a report and say, oh, well, there's a pharmacogenomic problem or, oh, there's not. You really need a few more details than that. So if there is a pharmacogenomic interaction, 
then in most reports, you'll be able to find a section where it'll ex explain it in a little bit more detail. So in our reports, we'll then say whether we're expecting maybe decreased levels of expression or metabolism or whatnot, and whether you're expecting maybe to worry about toxicity versus lack of efficacy, some of those sorts of pieces of information that are helpful to know. Because just because a drug shows up in this section, it doesn't mean it's a drug that can't be used for that patient. It might just need a different dose potentially, or maybe a different drug would be better depending on the specific situation. All right, so this brings us to one of the main topics that I wanted to talk about, and this is the transition from reactive testing to preemptive testing. So there's a few things that have really set us up to be able to do this. And one of them is higher throughput genotyping technologies. So because of these new technologies, sometimes we can do a lot of genetic testing in the form of panels at a more affordable cost, and it also makes it so that then they're more widely available. So the reason that this is the case is because we can multiplex more. So we can test more variants and more genes at the same time because of the advances in technology. But the cool thing about that is that means that instead of having multiple separate different tests and workflows for each gene, we're able to consolidate that. And that gains a lot of efficiency for the laboratory also, so it can free up the personnel for other projects or testing. So in our own laboratory, we went from well over 14 workflows to suddenly having one really nice streamlined workflow for the bulk of the pharmacogenomic testing that we offer. And this is really specific to our targeted genotyping because we also do offer some sequencing tests, but really going from multiple different platforms and separate tests to having this one streamlined workflow, it really made the costs come down on some of the tests. And again, especially the ability to offer a panel, which is I think important and I'll show you why in the next couple of slides. So just thinking about the fact that you can test more variants at a time, wanted to show you a little bit of why that's important. So on the top, we've got an example of a, a TPMT test where we only are testing for a couple of different genetic variants at the same time or SNPs shown by the orange arrows versus an assay where we've included more of them. And so in, for the most part, if the patient has a variant and it's one of the most common ones and it's one that's included in both tests, you'll detect it. And it doesn't really matter in that case what variants you did or didn't test for because you found the one that the patient had. So in this case, this particular one is corresponding to what we'd call the star two allele. So in both cases, the patient would get the same result and everything's good. But now let's say the variant is over here. Well, if this particular assay on the top did not include that test or that assay in their, their test design, so they aren't looking for that specific genetic variant, they can't see it versus the test below is designed to detect that variant. So in this case, in pharmacogenomics, we do something interesting where instead of saying positive or negative, we result out what we think the genotype is. And by convention, if we don't see any of the genetic variants that we happen to be looking for, then we call it a star one or a normal metabolizer if both alleles are star one. So this patient would get a result of star one for this particular um, allele, even though they happen to have a genetic variant, it's just one not detected by that test. Versus on the bottom test, that that variant was included, so it would be detected, and then it would be resulted out as star four. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides, but in general, as more variants are included in the test, the sensitivity of the test increases, but there are some diminishing returns. Once you start adding variants that you won't ever see in the population, then maybe it doesn't end up being as helpful, but in a lot of cases, we used to go from very, very few variants that we were looking for in pharmacogenomics, and now we can have more complete tests. So I think that's a really good thing for our patients. So a little bit more on single genes versus panels. So in general, the single genes are what people have historically always ordered because that's pretty much all that we had available. And so they used to be um, at first less expensive than a panel because sometimes if you were doing a panel, you weren't really doing a panel. You were actually doing multiple single genes and then putting them together in one report. But at this point in time, now when you're doing a panel, you're really doing one test or maybe sometimes a couple put together. But at any rate, so the single genes used to be less expensive, but now the cost is really pretty similar. One thing to note is that they provide less information to the providers. So I think there are some pros and cons to that. On the pro side, if it's a busy specialist, maybe they don't have to worry about all of the other genes that the patient might have variants in and how that might impact their other medications if there's a very specific question that they're working on answering. But on the flip side, maybe that's a downside because the patient sometimes would benefit from knowing about those other genetic variants and maybe their other providers would want that information to help further tailor their therapy. 
Uh, also with the single genes, as I showed you a couple minutes ago, it's more of a gene-centric report where there's usually limited information about specific medications. So then that's a little bit more work on the ordering provider to go out and look at the FDA label or look at the guidelines to know how to use that information. So on the flip side with the panels, I think the thing that's the most beneficial is sometimes you'll be looking at a drug or a couple of drugs that you're trying to decide between that go through different pathways. So if you needed to look at several genes to really know the best treatment for that particular patient, it's kind of nice because it's just one test that you might have to order instead of those multiple individual tests. And so hopefully at this point that might make the cost a little bit lower since it's one thing you're ordering instead of separate tests. Uh, also with the panels, it can aid in the deciding between the medications that are metabolized by the different pathways, but also uh, patients that are on multiple different medications, so polypharmacy, or they've got a lot of uh, complex comorbidities. It's just nice to have that genetic information to be able to supplement all of the other variables that are being considered when dosing the patient. So I think one of the coolest thing though about panels is you can really use them for current and future questions. So with a single gene, if you ordered CYP2D6 and CYP2D6 metabolizes a lot of different medications, maybe you needed it for the question that you had today and it might actually be useful for another question for a different drug metabolized by CYP2D6 later, but it typically oftentimes wasn't necessarily reused. A lot of times the single gene tests were just used that one time. But for the panels, since you're getting multiple genes at the same time, then definitely you want to be able to have the opportunity to use that when the patient comes in needing a different medication for a different indication because you'd already have those results available. So that's really what brings us into the ability to even think about preemptive testing today. So reactive testing used to be what we would have performed at the point in time when the patient needs a medication. And the biggest downside to that is that the patient comes in, they need their medication. There's a specific gene that you would want to ideally test so that you could figure out the best dose for that patient or whether maybe that's not the right drug for the patient. But then as much as we try to be quick in the laboratory, we can't just give you a result as soon as you order the test. So that was kind of one of the biggest downsides is then you have to wait for that result to come back. And then that particular result could be used to guide the dosing or selection for that very specific application. And so usually in this setting, only one gene would be ordered or maybe a couple of genes. And again, the results wouldn't necessarily be used in the future. So as long as they came back to the provider at that point in time and could be used at that point in time, that was sufficient. But the beauty of preemptive testing is that the patient might already then have the results in the EHR. So then when the provider goes to order that medication, instead of having to order the test and then wait a few days for the results to come back and then figure out what to do, the results might just be there waiting for them, able to be used right now. And so with preemptive testing, because of that, it can be used to guide perhaps a current prescription, in which case you have to probably wait a little bit for your results to come back if that's the point in time that the testing is ordered, kind of more as a reactive test that becomes preemptive. But then once you've got those results, you can refer back to them again and again. And so again, for preemptive testing to work, it really needs to be panel-based because it's hard to really know what medications a patient might end up on in the future. Uh, and also the thing that's really important is once that information comes back, if you've ever looked in an EHR before, there is a lot of data in there and it's really hard to find something from two years ago. So the information has to be accessible to the future providers and they have to know that it exists to even look for it in the first place. So some advances have really come along uh, the way that have helped with that too. So we'll talk about them in the, the next slide after this one. So in general, the biggest advantages of preemptive testing, everyone would have the information readily available as needed. You can use your high throughput testing and multiplexing for cost-effective testing. And the patients are probably going to eventually end up taking a medication at some point. So it's probably going to be data that's used by most individuals. And really, if we could universally apply this, it would really decrease morbidity and mortality and the cost of adverse drug reactions as well. So again, I said I'd come back to the requirements to have successful preemptive testing. So first off, the tests have to actually be ordered. They have to be broadly applicable. So again, that's why it's important to have panels so that they're applicable to many different medications. The results have to be in a very consistent format so that the electronic medical record is able to retrieve them and utilize them. And then the data has to be around long-term. The providers have to know that this is something useful to them so that they order the tests and use the results. 
And then my favorite piece, the clinical decision support. So what that might look like is sometimes providers will get a pop-up alert. So if the patient already has genetic testing results, for example, for CYP2C19, and they're trying to order escitalopram, if the patient has a phenotype that suggests that maybe you want to do something different, a pop-up might show up like this. And then the provider always has the option to follow along with the suggestion or to uh, decide that, no, this is really what's best for my patient and to um, bypass the, the clinical decision support alert. But this makes it a little bit easier because then the provider doesn't necessarily have to go back and hunt around for that information if they know that the patient already had the test done and now they're using it for another application. So at Mayo, we keep adding more and more of these drugs. There are a number of them that are underway for the clinical decision support alerts. So this just shows you by gene and drug, the ones that are currently available. And we even have some looking at liver transplant and pharmacogenomic testing because it's a bit much to get into for today. But if the patient had a liver transplant and you did a test looking at their blood, it's probably not going to match up with all of the enzymes that are most highly expressed in the liver. So another topic for another day. So now I want to talk a little bit more about some of the standardization efforts. And I think these really tie back into that transition from reactive to preemptive testing, because if we've got more standardization across laboratories, then as you can imagine, if a patient is seen at Mayo Clinic today, and then maybe they go back home and they want to get care closer to home, well, if the pharmacogenomics tests are similar, then the provider that they see back home might not have to worry so much about, well, how is it that Mayo Clinic does this compared to the other lab? And so I think it makes it a little bit easier for people to move around and take their results with them. So there is still some variability in pharmacogenomic tests, and some of this is what we're working on. So one thing is that the testing technique that's used can be variable at this point. And this is not something that anyone's necessarily trying to standardize in and of itself. So some labs might do sequencing, some labs might use a mass array. So it would be a mass spec for genotyping. Some labs might use real-time PCR. As long as we all get the same results, the testing technique is probably a little bit less important. Although we'll talk about the differences between sequencing and genotyping towards the end. Uh, but the genes and variants that are included or the specific alleles included, this is variable and this is something we're working on. Uh, nomenclature used to be more variable, but this is another area that the field is working on. The translation to predicted phenotype, as I mentioned earlier with CYP2D6, looking at the activity score and how you get from that to the predicted phenotype, that's a really good example of some standardization that's been successful in recent years. And then reporting structure can be pretty variable. So again, if you order a single gene versus a panel, you might see a very different type of report. So it's important for providers to be able to interpret that information that they're getting back. But there also can be a lot of variability in the medications that are included in the report for those recommendations or whether medications are even included in the report or not. And some panels might be designed for a very specific application. So earlier when I showed you, we had panels that are more for psychiatry and some that are for thiopurines, very different applications. And then I think one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that the results could be integrated into fields in the electronic medical record, in which case they can trigger those downstream clinical decision support alerts if those are built, or sometimes they're just returned as a PDF. And that's a little bit trickier because then it might be harder to find those results later when somebody else wants to use them. So one of the things that's important too about standardization is not only patients being able to go from point A to point B and take their results with them, but also if the test designs are not consistent, you can get discordant interpretation and therapeutic recommendations. And I'll show you an example here. So if you've got test one that's looking at whatever gene we're talking about for today, your favorite gene, and it detects the star two, star five, and star nine alleles, and then another laboratory has a test that does star two, star three, star four, and star five, and the patient actually has a genotype of star one, star four. Well, test one doesn't test for star four, so this will report out star one, star one, normal metabolizer, just like that TPMT example from a few minutes ago, versus test two would be able to detect that star four, and then this patient is going to be called an intermediate metabolizer. And you can imagine how confusing that would be if the patient happened to get two different pharmacogenomic tests done at two different places and then shows up with both of these reports. So the more we can standardize, the easier this will make it on everybody. So in this case, both tests performed exactly as expected. They produced perfectly accurate results for what that test was designed to do. So it's not like one of the laboratories was bad and one of the laboratories was good. It's just really boils down to what their test design was. 
But in this case, again, different genotypes were reported, different phenotypes were, were reported, and this could potentially lead to very different medication recommendations for the patient, despite having this genotype that just get, got reported out two different ways. So why this is really important is it's interesting that because of pharmacogenes having these variants that are actually somewhat common, they might differ from population to population to some extent. So for example, looking at TPMT and then NUDT15, which also metabolizes thiopurines, uh, we have data from a large population uh, database, NOMAD, and it includes about 123,000 exome sequences and 15,000 whole genome sequences from unrelated individuals. And if you look at that data, uh, for the European non-Finnish population, there are a couple of TPMT variants that are pretty common, about 4% roughly. And so these are definitely ones that would be included in our test design. But historically, in UDT15, no one realized that this gene was that exciting or that important, so we didn't test for it. But we didn't really understand why some populations, particularly patients of Asian descent, were getting quite a bit of thiopurine toxicity, but you couldn't really predict it very well with the TPMT tests because the frequency of these TPMT variants is pretty low. So something else was probably going on. Well, in this case, it turns out that there are some variants in NUDT15 that are particularly common in Asian populations. And if you didn't include NUDT15 in your test, or you didn't include this specific variant, these patients would be completely missed. And so you might actually be introducing a healthcare disparity if the test isn't appropriately designed to cover alleles that are common in all of the populations that are being served by your practice. So I think this is just something really important to note that it's very important to include the variants that are found in the population that the test is designed to be used for. In the United States, this is particularly relevant because we know that we've got patients that are coming from populations all around the world. And so we need to be very inclusive in this particular regard of our test designs. So again, if only TPMT variants are included in a test, patients of Asian descent might then end up getting a test result that says that they're at normal risk of toxicity rather than being identified as patients that might end up requiring a lower dose. And there are other populations that would be impacted by this as well, but this was just the um, example that I wanted to show you guys about uh, how this might, might be in practice. So what are those efforts to reduce variability? Well, I think one of the most exciting areas is we've got FarmVar that's curating the haplotype information. So this dates back to the Karolinska Institute used to uh, curate the haplotype information for the cytochrome P450s, but now FarmVar has taken that on and they've added additional genes too. So this is definitely a source I go to on a daily basis. And there's also a pharmacogenomics working group that was started by the Association for Molecular Pathology. And now they've added other societies, including the College of American Pathologists and other groups as well. And they're recommending which variants at a minimum should be included in a clinical test. And so far they've looked at CYP2C19, CYP2C9, warfarin-related genes, and CYP2D6. And I mentioned CPIC earlier, they've been doing a great job of recommending standard phenotype nomenclature and guidelines that somewhat address the translation of genotype to phenotype. And they led a lot of that effort for CYP2D6 standardization. At this point, we really haven't had a lot of standardization for which genes would be included in a panel. And so that's something to keep out for or keep an eye out for is if you're interested in ordering a panel for a patient, make sure that it includes the genes that you think are needed for whatever the clinical indications are that you're worried about for that particular patient. So now we'll move on to sequencing based approaches versus targeted genotyping. So what I mean by this is a genotyping test is again going to be testing for very specific variants. So if we had the gene as this line in blue, genotyping will look for just the variants shown by the orange arrows versus a sequencing assay could presumably detect anything that's in that region that's being tested. So if we have a variant right here, for example, our genotyping test will not be able to detect that particular variant. And this will only be a problem though, if that variant actually would have altered the enzyme or the protein's function. But for a sequencing test, you'll see it, but the question is, what does it do? So sometimes you can find some very rare variants and there might be limited clinical information available so it can be difficult to interpret. So typically the genotyping tests have been a lot less expensive and that's why they've been historically performed, but sequencing is really coming down in cost. So maybe we'll start switching over to it at some point here. 
And generally, genotyping has a quicker turnaround time, which is really important if the testing is being done in the reactive setting, because nobody wants to wait a few weeks to hear back about that result to get initiated on their medication. But for the sequencing assays, the tur turnaround time is still typically longer. But if we're doing more and more preemptive testing, this might be less significant of an issue. However, I think in a lot of cases when preemptive testing is used, it really does still start out as reactive in a lot of cases where the patient is being tested for a specific indication and then the results are reused. So in that case, the turnaround time is still probably pretty important for those patients depending on what that clinical question was. So most laboratories today are still performing targeted genotyping assays, but I will note that in our own laboratory, we're doing some sequencing for a couple of genes, so specifically DPYD, UGT, 1A1, and G6PD. And so these ones have some hereditary implications in addition to pharmacogenomics. And it's always interesting because we do find rare variants and sometimes they're a little bit difficult to classify, uh, but we usually try to convey the uncertainty in the report back to the clinician who ordered it. And there are some laboratories performing sequencing-based chemistry, but at this point in time, most of them are interpreting the results as genotyping. So basically, they set up which variants they're looking for up front, and if they see a variant in here, either bioinformatically or by other ways, they're not actually looking at that, even if they've sequenced the whole region. So oftentimes, these laboratories will just be reviewing or interpreting or reporting their predefined sets. But as you can imagine, it probably wouldn't be that hard technically to make the switch to treating it like sequencing. It's just that then there are all the challenges that come along with these rare variants, which that's what we'll talk about next. So the right 10 k study I mentioned earlier was Mayo Clinic's experience using next generation sequencing for pharmacogenomics. And there was over 10,000 patients that were tested and in total 77 pharmacogenes were actually sequenced, but a lot of these weren't interpreted clinically. We only interpreted 13 of them clinically and put those into the electronic medical record, but the rest of them are available and used for research purposes. And so here you can see again that list of genes and CYP2D6 is highlighted to come back to in a little bit because it's kind of a complicated gene. But what we ended up doing in this case is this is a research study, but it's kind of blended with clinical since the results were put into the electronic medical record. Well, we decided to actually interpret this as a sequencing test. So all of those rare variants, we knew we were going to find them. We knew we were going to have to handle them, but we decided to go for it and see what challenges we would find. So again, the data was deposited in discrete fields in the electronic medical record, so those clinical decision support alerts could fire as needed. So one of the things that definitely came up is these novel or rare variants. And normally in hereditary genetics, we use the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and AMP variant classification guidelines. But these aren't really ideal or definitely not designed for pharmacogenomics, so we had to make a few modifications to them. But we still were trying to think about the variants on this continuum from pathogenic to benign. But in all honesty, a lot of these rare variants end up falling into being of uncertain significance. But the great thing is if you have found that variant and you've reported that variant, Later, when there's more information about it, you can potentially go back and reinterpret it versus on targeted genotyping. If you never even saw the variant, you'd never know to go back to look at it later to see if you can say something more about it. So the criteria that we were looking at is variant frequency. So how common is it? Evolutionary conservation, differences between amino acids, some splicing predictions, and probably the most important one is the literature. And so definitely for some of these rare variants, they've actually been classified in the literature and some of them not so much. Uh, if they had functional data or x-ray crystallography, some of those things are particularly helpful pieces of literature for classifying these variants. But the downside is that if you're doing this in a clinical setting, you have to do this in real time to be able to report a phenotype. So kind of as a side project to the right 10 k one of the things we decided to look at is since we're doing targeted genotyping clinically, what are we really missing by doing that instead of sequencing? So we went to the public database, the genetic testing registry that talks about all sorts of different laboratories and what tests they're performing for pharmacogenomics and, and other tests as well, and reviewed the websites from those labs as well as the data that was in the GTR and any reports that we had to figure out, well, what alleles are they testing for? And then based on that information, created an in silico panel that includes the variants that are included in the test design by at least 50% of laboratories. And then we compared the results of the sequencing-based approach, the right 10K that we actually put into the electronic medical record, to the results that would have been obtained if we were only doing this in silico panel instead. So we basically, what are the variants that would have been missed? 
And here are the genes that we looked at. And what we found is, and here are the, the actual variants that were included in our in silico panel. And it seemed like there were quite a few variants that were missed, but it depended on each gene. So for example, in total, we had 28% of the participants had at least one variant that would have been missed. So I think that's still pretty significant. But if you look across them, the number of participants with a variant that would have been missed, are it's the most common in CYP2D6, which is not terribly shocking as a more complicated gene, as well as DPYD and SLC01B1. And one thing to note with SLC01B1, a lot of these were variants of uncertain significance. So maybe that means that this is a gene that just needs a lot more attention and study. Uh, so in general, these were our main top genes with missed variants. And as I mentioned earlier, in our laboratory, we do offer DPYD sequencing. So that made me feel better that we kind of have an idea of what we might be missing. And if a patient's genotype doesn't really fit with what they're seeing clinically, there's another option. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is the number of variants that were not detected. So not the number of people, but how many different variants. Again, DPYD and CYP2D6 were coming up at the top of the list for the most variants that would have been missed. So that makes it a little bit harder because for some of these, there were just a couple of variants that were very common and clinically significant. And so we could pretty easily remedy that with targeted genotyping by maybe just adding a couple of more variants to panels. Uh, so I think that's kind of something to keep in mind. But in general, there's still a fair amount that could be missed by doing targeted genotyping. So I think sequencing is the way that we want to move in the future. But why aren't we doing this routinely right now? Well, the turnaround time, as I mentioned earlier, is still pretty long, still pretty expensive. There are some technical challenges with complex and repetitive regions and homologous genes and pseudogenes. And because of these technical challenges, you might need some specialized software, especially for CYP2D6 and the HLA region. And again, there are all those difficult to interpret rare variants that take time and thought to figure out what to, to say about them. And they might be frustrating clinically too, because sometimes they get stuck as being a VUS and it's hard to know what to do with them. And then interestingly, we didn't really expect as many nomenclature challenges, but I'll touch on that. So CYP2D6, difficult by next generation sequencing because there's a CYP2D7 pseudogene that is non-functional, but very highly homologous to CYP2D6. And so you can get some mismapping of reads. And so historically, for the original Wright study that I didn't really talk about that only had 1,000 patients, we used Luminex plus copy number variation by real-time PCR to be able to figure out CYP2D6. But that was going to be much too expensive for 10,000 patients. So we got lucky in that my colleague, Dr. John Black, along with another colleague, Ug Sakati, developed an algorithm for CYP2D6 by next-generation sequencing. And so that's how we were able to accomplish that for the Wright 10K study. And just to give you an idea of how complicated CYP2D6 is, here you can see the CYP2D6 gene in orange and then a lighter orange of the CYP2D7 pseudogene. Well, sometimes CYP2D6 gets duplicated, it can be deleted, it can form these fancy hybrid alleles with CYP2D7, and they can be the first half 2D6, the second half 2D7, or flipped the other way. And then you can have hybrids plus a regular copy of the gene or a hybrid all by itself. So it gets pretty complicated in a hurry. So haplotypes are when you have two or more variants inherited together. And this is what we often see in pharmacogenomics. And so just for something for awareness for anyone that's not as familiar, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about these star alleles. Instead of having to report out each variant individually, you just give it a common name. And so why do we use that? Well, here might be an example of some raw data from CYP2D6 sequencing. Now, some of these variants are benign and some of them are ones that would actually be clinically significant. But wow, that's a lot to put on a report and probably wouldn't make anybody happy to receive this. So what we end up doing is looking at FarmVar to figure out what variants go with which variants. And as you can see in the background, there's a lot of tables that would be sorting this out, but the ones in red are part of CYP2D6 star 2A, the ones in blue are part of star four, and then some that were actually homozygous in this example are common to both alleles. And so instead of reporting out all of that, we just say star 2A star four, and third intermediate metabolizer. So again, here's FarmVar where we would go looking for CYP2D6. And the problem though is sometimes you get here and you're like, oh, the variant that we found isn't in FarmVar. Well, we can't give it a star allele, so now what are we gonna do? Well, if this was in a research setting, you're probably all set. 
you can contact FarmVar. They're very nice. And I'm sure they'll give a new number to your allele once you've given them sufficient evidence that this is a thing that you found. And so that's great if you're publishing it. It's great if you're in the research setting. But in general, the patient and the provider, they really don't want to wait for that. So that's not ideal in the clinical setting. So the other piece that gets complicated is, again, on the interpretation side, some of them are going to be very straightforward, some of them are not going to be very well characterized, and you're going to get those VUSs. So at this point, there's really not a standardized way of reporting the genotype or the phenotype in that setting. So here at Mayo, we ended up by necessity developing a system reporting the two star alleles along with the rare variant, and then also using uh, phenotype ranges when these variants of uncertain significance were encountered. So how that looks, let's say the patient's genotype is star 2a star 4, but we also found a reportable rare variant. So the cis trans status, so is this variant with the star 2a or is it with the star 4? Sometimes you can determine that when you're looking at next generation sequencing, and sometimes you can't. So if you know that they're on the same allele, what we ended up deciding to do is we wrote with a heterozygous, whatever that variant was, using HGVS nomenclature, and then on the other side of our slash, we put the star 4. But sometimes you don't know. So in that case, we decided it was best to put the star 2a and the star 4 together and then use a semicolon to indicate what this other variant was that we also detected. And so just to show this in pictorial form, uh, so you can have, again, the cis tra trans status is unknown. So here we've got a star 2 and a star 6. And in option 1, the variant is with the star 2. Well, you can just say it's with that star 2. Or if it's with the star 6, you could say it's with the star 6. But if you don't know, Again, we separated them with the semicolon. And then in some cases, you've got a variant of uncertain significance. So we looked at kind of the worst case scenario that, well, if the variant is deleterious and we know it's on this star two allele, it's a poor metabolizer, but if it's benign, it does nothing. And maybe then it ends up being just an intermediate metabolizer. So in that case, we would use terminology like poor to intermediate metabolizer. And so here's just a few examples of how we handled some of those. So in general, next generation sequencing and pharmacogenomics, uh, if you had an exome sequenced for some other clinical purpose, could you get pharmacogenomics out of it? Well, you certainly could, and some laboratories do, and we have in the past as well. But keep in mind that from an exome, you won't see a lot of the promoter variants and some of the deeply intronic variants that we know impact function. And also CYP2D6 and HLA genes can definitely be a challenge off of a standard exome without specialized software. And if you did get an exome and it came along with pharmacogenomics, it's just good to look at the report and the methodology or maybe talk to the laboratory to figure out if they interpreted it as targeted genotyping or as sequencing. And in general, the exome report doesn't always give a lot of clarity as to which pharmacogenes they actually did look at and interpret, if any, versus which ones had no variants identified. So if you really wanted to use the pharmacogenomics from that setting, you might want to talk again to the laboratory, look at the report, or maybe it's just more of a screen and you would actually want to order a separate pharmacogenomics test that's de dedicated to looking at those genes. So people also like to ask about genomes. At this point, they're still a little bit on the expensive side, so you don't see them quite as routinely. But in theory, pharmacogenomics interpretation and reporting should be possible off of those. So that might be an exciting thing to look forward to in the future. And speaking of the future, well, earlier I showed you the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic pathway. I do think we'll be focused more on the pharmacodynamic genes in the future. So I'm hoping to see more of that. But also, anybody notice all these other genes that are in these pathways? So right now we're really only focused on a few of them but maybe we'll be able to look at other genes and also figuring out, well, how do they all interact with each other? Because maybe it's a problem if this patient has a normal CYP2C19, but everything else on this screen is decreased activity, or maybe that's okay. So I think those are some of the things we don't really fully understand all of the complexity, and we can't really utilize all of that data together quite yet at this point. So current state, we're looking at one gene or a few genes at the time. We're also really focused on just the coding regions. And at this point, how you historically would figure out what a new variant does is there would be maybe a graduate student, maybe me a few years back in somebody's laboratory performing functional studies that are actually pretty labor intensive to figure out what that variant does to that particular protein. But hopefully future state, there might be more AI-based approaches. Uh, perhaps we can look at data all across the genome, combine the impact of multiple variants simultaneously. I think we'll also maybe be able to move towards understanding and interrogating those intronic and intergenic regions. 
And my favorite as that graduate student performing those labor intensive methods in the past is that now they actually have a lot of really cool high throughput functional studies that can better classify rare variants and many, many variants at a time. So in some cases, they've even done studies where they've looked at all of the variants in a gene and classified them all kind of in one fell swoop, which is pretty neat. And I think that'll really help us in the future if we do try to switch from targeted genotyping to sequencing to be able to actually figure out how to interpret all of those rare variants, because maybe somebody's already studied them using these high throughput functional studies. So I'm really excited about that. So in summary, pharmacogenomics is increasingly implemented. It's an exciting area. It probably impacts almost all of us. There are frequently new evidence-based guidelines being published. There are drugs being uh, FDA approved that have pharmacogenomic associations. And at this point, we're doing still some reactive testing, but hopefully we'll be switching to preemptive in the future. A lot of standardization efforts that are underway, and these are really exciting. Uh, we also have the activity scores that are coming. And I would expect in the future, we'll see more sequencing, but there are definitely still some challenges to overcome there. So pharmacogenomics is a really quickly moving field. It's exciting to be a part of. And hopefully if it's something you're thinking about, you'll jump in and find out more information because I think the more of us that are looking at pharmacogenomics, the quicker it can even move to help our patients. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Moyer. We will now transition to the Q&A uh, session of this presentation. As a reminder, you can still use your uh, chat feature located at the bottom of the screen. And the first question we have, Dr. Moyer, says, uh, comes from Shannon. She asked, is Mayo Clinic offering to investigate patients' benefits or costs prior to ordering the panels? Oh, so is the question basically looking at how expensive the testing would be for the patient and whether their insurance would cover it? It seems that way. Yeah, so I think that's something that's definitely and also an area that's rapidly evolving. And I thought about including a slide or two on it, but I think we've seen some exciting advances recently with some of the insurers actually drafting some uh, some, I can't remember what they're actually called, but basically suggesting that they will cover this testing more than they used to. But the thing to note is it's very different from one insurance company to the next. It also depends on the specific test that someone is proposing to order for that specific patient and also what the clinical indication is. So if it's the correct clinical indication, for and a test that's one that it would qualify based on that insurer, in some cases they will cover it. But it's definitely something that if it cost is a concern to a patient, I would really want them to talk to their insurer first so that they don't get surprised later when something isn't covered and it's more than they wanted to, to pay for a test. So the good news is the cost of testing has really decreased quite a bit, but depending on the patient's financial situation, it still can be kind of expensive. And so we certainly would want people to be able to afford their medication first, if that's kind of what they're worried about. And there's other things you could think about in addition to pharmacogenomics. So I think at this point, pharmacoeconomics is definitely still a consideration. Thank you for that. Looks like we do have another question that just came in from Christina. Where do you see the role of epigenetics in this field? Yeah, epigenetics is something I didn't even mention at all, but it's something I always think about. So for anyone that's less familiar, epigenetics is a lot of those other, uh, other modifications to the genome. So for example, I think one of the ones that I would expect to see sooner rather than later is methylation, for example. So things that can kind of turn genes on and off, sometimes based on environmental exposures. And we know that with pharmacogenomics, a number of these genes can be induced and inhibited by either other medications or by things that people might eat or be exposed to in the environment. So especially like CYP1A2 is a particularly good example where it can be induced by smoking. And so I think epigenetics is something that we might see in the future, but at this point, we're not doing it really in pharmacogenomics in the clinical space at this point, but perhaps down the road. I imagine we'll see it in the research realm first and then Hopefully people will sort more of it out and then we can adopt it clinically as well. All right, looks like we have a, a couple more that just came in. How might the 21st Century Cures Act, which mandates the electronic release of all test results to patients, EHR, shape the success of preemptive testing in the clinical setting? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if it'll drastically change things because typically right now when a test is ordered clinically, the results will show up in the EHR already. 
And uh, so I think historically though, sometimes maybe the patient didn't have access to those results necessarily directly, but maybe whoever ordered the test for them would have those results, but they would always be getting back the genotype and the phenotype and the pieces that they needed to make a clinical decision based on it. But I think one of the things that might be a little bit different is not everywhere did patients always have access to that themselves. I think portals have really become more popular over the last few years. And so more patients have had access anyway, but I think the remainder of patients that maybe it was a little bit more difficult, maybe they'll have a little bit better access to their own reports. And I definitely wouldn't want a patient to ever be on their own looking at that report and deciding, oh, I better stop taking this medication because it's in the section that had that little scary orange triangle. But I think it's really important for patients to be advocates for their own health care. And if they see that they've got this result, perhaps in their portal or wherever they're able to obtain it from now, and they see that there's a medication that they're taking that's on it, that's definitely a good way to start up the conversation with their ordering provider. Chances are they may have already taken that into consideration, because especially if you've been on a medication long term and it's working really well, then whatever dosage adjustments were needed probably have already been incorporated in over time. And again, remember, there's all those other variables beyond genetics. But I definitely think it'll be good for patients to be able to see those results a little bit more readily and again to be advocates for themselves. So here we have one from Paul. Have there been cases of drug manufacturers actually modifying standard dosing recommendations as PGX knowledge has developed? I think I've got a really good example for that. So some of those thiopurine medications, for example, they've had TPMT in the drug label for a little while because I think that's something that emerged early and was a fantastic example of pharmacogenomics. But NUDT15, as I mentioned earlier, was this additional gene that was just discovered to have a role in thiopurine metabolism and be predictive of toxicity really not that long ago. I want to say it was like 2015, 2016. That one already got incorporated into the FDA label several years ago. So I think the FDA is paying attention to pharmacogenomics, and I think they're interested in it. And now they're publishing right there on their website a couple of different resources of different tables to make that information a lot more accessible, too. And so as someone who works on designing pharmacogenomic tests and interpreting them, I absolutely love these FDA tables. So it's great that they're engaged in this space. And last one for today, would long reading sequencing potentially overcome the challenges of sequencing regions such as CYP2D6 and HLA? I think long range sequencing would be fantastic. Our laboratory isn't using it clinically at this point in time, but I have on my to-do list checking out CYP2D6 and in my hereditary genetic space, I've got a couple of genes of interest and I know I've got several other colleagues that are looking at genes that might be more amenable to those long read uh, uh, methodologies also. So fantastic question. And I do hope that's something we see more of in the future also. This concludes our presentation for the day. Thank you to Dr. Moyer, Mayo Clinic Laboratories, and the Center for Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic.